Thank you, everybody. Let's give a, a, a round of applause for Richard. Uh, at the very least, you can maybe see us applauding while we're on Zoom. I, I think the, this is a, I mean, Richard's remarks and the conversation we had earlier today, you know, sets up a really important nexus of discussion around trade and technology that is perfect for this next group of panelists that I'm going to bring on, on board in a little bit. This, this panel is titled Energy and Energy Technology and Trade. Uh, it's brought to you by our partner, National Grid, is a fantastic sponsor of this effort. To that end, I'd like to bring on Autumn Brown, Senior, Pro Senior Procurement Manager at Terra Power, Joe Ibrahim, Senior Director of Engineering and Construction at National Grid Renewables, John Munkin, uh, a Principal at Converge Strategies, and Ben Richardson, Energy Portfolio Director at the Defensive In Innovation Unit. Let's give them a round of applause before we get started. So to kick things off, I, I'm struck by the tenor that suddenly trade has, has taken around the deployment of clean energy technologies. We're talking about uh, supply chains and the resilience of those supply chains, access to those supply chains, um, all of which are core parts of the trade agenda, but nonetheless critical to you know, getting these clean energy technologies from the lab desk into, into the local communities they're designed to serve. And I think on this panel, we have four extraordinary perspectives on that nexus between technological development and trade. And so I'd like to turn to each of you kind of one by one for some initial reflections on where do you see your particular company or organization fitting within that nexus between trade and technology? And Autumn, I might start with you. Terra Power, uh, you know, a innovator in the nuclear energy space, okay. right? Uh, on the cusp of some of both the innovative technologies that are gonna shape the nuclear, the nuclear industry for the yeah. future but also on the cusp of the supply chain right. risks that, are, that come with that innovation. Right. Right. How do you think about this relationship between trade and technology in order to get your reactors out into the world? I think we would definitely have to rely heavily on the Department of Energy um, uh, with this Russia crisis uh, or invasion of Ukraine. Um, that has changed our strategy from, uh, you know, going to Russia, procuring uh, HALU from Russia. Um, so, um, you know, reliance on DOE to help build the supply chain um, for the production of HALU is, is essential to our success in um, deploying our advanced nuclear reactors, even with this demonstration, um, the ARDP. Um, award that we received from DOE um, last year. Um, we need fuel for our advanced reactors. And uh, uh, so uh, the government's help with this new inflation bill, uh, I think will, you know, get us, you know, that, that those investments and the, uh, the support we need to, to build that supply chain. Joe, I might turn to you next. A, a similar question. National Grid Renewables, obviously, you're not in the nuclear space, you're in a, a wider range of, of power generation products. Mm -hmm. uh, so in a way, your supply chain risk, your trade concerns are also you know, quite broad, have that breadth. How do you think through this issue? And also, strategically speaking, how do you manage the breadth of those supply chain concerns? Yeah, so I mean, our focus is on the deployment of utility scale, wind, mm -hmm. solar, and energy storage. So that, that takes a lot of different resources. Um, so I think from our standpoint, <clears throat> the i guess the continued motivation around maybe moving away from what we consider to be conventional energy resources to more renewables and and what that means at least domestically for the agendas around manufacturing and mining and so again you know what materials do we have what capabilities do we have you know within our borders to ultimately produce the goods needed mm -hmm. to be able to to deploy that so that's that's kind of the the battle we're in right now. So, you know, so much of what the industry that, that I'm focused in requires from the globe, right, globally, especially when it comes to raw materials, that, that's really one of the big challenges right now. I think domestically as well, just the strategy around our grid and continuing to improve the capabilities around getting transmission, so getting the energy from where we can, you know, deploy it um, back to then the load centers. So both, both kind of key things right now that, that we're trying to manage priorities around. Definitely. And uh, John, Joe mentioned the grid, so I'm going to turn to you next, because I know that's a particular uh, area of focus for you at Converge. But also at Converge, I know you're, you're able to take your, you have this kind of wider, uh, you know, 3,000 foot view of what's going on in this yeah. space. How do you 
see this nexus of clean energy technology deployment and, and growing supply chain dependencies around that deployment evolving, particularly from a, you know, from a national security perspective, but also uh, from, a, from a foreign policy perspective as we look to deploy and export these technologies abroad. Yeah, I mean, I think where we find ourselves right now is kind of the, the old school elementary school word problem. A train leaves Chicago at 45 miles an hour and another train leaves 30 miles an hour in St. Louis. The problem is we didn't have the variables plugged in. We had the words for the word problem, but we didn't actually have the variables that we needed to understand where these supply chain dependencies were ultimately going to manifest. Yep. And people had information that could fill those variables. And now I think with the IRA, first off, it gives the level of predictability that I think a lot of people have been lacking about what is policy going to do or not do to be able to support this? What level of investment is appropriate so that people don't find themselves over investing in particular areas that are not economically viable because of a changing policy environment? But to your point, as we see the pieces come together, right now there, there is a literal sense that if we look at it from a national security perspective and s apply the same word problem but look at it inside an installation, inside the fence line of a, a DOD installation and outside the fence line of how the private sector and utilities are trying to address it. Right now, we're still in a, a, a challenge where we don't know when those trains are going to meet. Yep. And I think what we really need to do is take a more holistic approach of saying we can anticipate where those supply chain bottlenecks are most likely to occur and what we can do to address them. But there needs to be better joint strategy to identify how we get there, right? So the demand signal that comes from the national security imperative of installations from the Department of Defense from thought leaders like Richard on, on how we're going to get there, need to be able to marry up to you know, the, what technologies we're pursuing, mm -hmm. what types of solutions are out there to be able to get us there, so what's reasonable, what's viable, what's going to be effective. Um, and I think facilitating conversations like this are essential to trying to figure out what those little pieces and parts are so that we can plug in those variables. You beat me to the punch and mentioned the IRA, but we're gonna table that for the next round of questions. Great. I, you know, I wanna turn to Ben. Uh, bring in the, the defense angle here. You know, DIU, you're on the cutting edge of, of building some of these technologies, but your exposure to your interest in the trade space is, is equally as great, because ultimately you want to see the, the work you're doing deployed into the field, and you also have exposure to the supply chain necessary to, supply chain inputs necessary for those technologies to succeed in the first place. How do you think about this nexus of trade and technology, and, and how is DIU kind of moving forward uh, with, to meet, you know, the, the clean energy goals set by the broader department. Yeah, thank you. Um, it's great following Richard because, you know, I'm, I'm the government person on the panel, so I can agree <laughs> with everything he just said. Um, Defense Innovation Unit's primary mission is to accelerate DOD's adoption of commercial technologies. So this trade and these issues we're having in supply chain impacts us because we're going after that commercial sector and that commercial sector is having those challenges with access. And I've got roughly, you know, 20 projects going on inside the portfolio right now, and, and every one of them has, you know, delays and, and uh, um, cost uh, issues right now due, due to supply chain related issues. Um, and that it really works against our thesis at DIU because by engaging the commercial sector um, versus tr some of the traditional players in the defense sector, you know, we're, we are looking for things that are faster, cheaper, and better. Uh, so we're, we're kind of running up against that. Um, we have a number of projects in the, in the uh, battery you know, you know, arena, uh, some direct, some indirect, and, and obviously you know, some of these things are coming up with supply chains and raw materials. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, Richard, I don't think he, he talked too much about like the, the Defense Production Act and the, and the money that's being put there. So even before the IRA, you know, there was already a, a, um, a presidential uh, directive on uh, using Title III in the de uh, Defense Production Act to, to, to get, get at those raw material piece of it. So we're working on those types of issues to help accelerate. So it's an interesting element for DIU because um, the uh, kind of where we sit in the supply chain, we can work on projects that are looking at new technologies too you know, find some of the raw materials and work on some of the supply chain issues, mm -hmm. but we're also working on very mature projects that are being directly impacted by lack of access to some of those uh, raw materials. I think, I mean, again, you mentioned the DPA, another area I want to hit on later. Uh, I also think it's worth mentioning, again, uh, the Congressman mentioned, you know, and we just saw the President sign the CHIPS Act, which is another a huge piece of, while we tend to get caught up in the raw materials piece of the, of the clean energy technology supply chain, semiconductors are equally as necessary, you know, to power any sort of electronic that we're looking for in this space. So I might, you know, turning back to turning back to, to Joe and Autumn, I might kind of ask you both to reflect on kind of this, this sea change in the policy space we've seen over the past week, week and a half, 
from you know, the, the surprise that we saw with the Inflation Reduction Act and what that means for your respective businesses and, and the trade and supply chain piece. But also, I think the CHIPS Act here is also worth mentioning because I know that plays a role in both of your technologies. I might go in reverse order, go to Joe first and then Autumn. So the, I guess from what's on the table today, and you know, maybe we, we can look at it at from, from two parts. One is the certainty you know, around the, the, the tax credits and things like that, that drive some value um, you know, with, within the, the areas that, that we try to, to, to deploy. Um, you know, there's definitely gonna be, I think, some positives that, that come out of it is from, a, from a certainty standpoint, extending you know, the, the number of years associated with that. Um, but it also then, you know, provides a little bit more complexity around, um, you know, some of the conditions, mm -hmm. you know, with that. So, you know, again, from my standpoint, if you if you look at the the bigger picture, you know, definitely some positives there as it, as it relates to deployment. Um, but it certainly starts to provide some complexity within it, um, and in all the different you know areas that you know whether it be again from, you know, local content, uh, you know, labor things like that. So if you separate that out. Definitely good for the domestic agenda, um, but when you talk about deployment to ultimately try to get to some of the other goals that, that we're trying to get to, it, it can it can provide a little bit of chaos as well. So, a little bit of little little bit of both. A little column A, a little column B. Yep. Yeah. yeah. There we go. We'll dive into column B in a bit. I think it's interesting to talk about, especially when you know Richard and also frankly the congressman spoke about you know China in a way is the, is the elephant in the room here that we're talking about. They're the behemoth in the supply chain. Uh, a lot of you know when you talk about China as a geostrategic. Uh, threat in some ways, uh, you need to actually think about, you know, an equally a strategic approach to loosening their grip on the supply chain. But first, Autumn, I'll turn to you. The, the IRA, the CHIPS Act, you know, I think we're seeing, to, uh, to Ben's point, a lot more emphasis on the DPA as kind of a quasi-industrial policy, mm -hmm. right? How does, Terra, how, does that, how does that change Terra Power's thinking, or how does that fit into Terra Power's thinking about you know, accessing the supply chains or building the supply chains necessary uh, to get your technologies uh, into the market? So I, I think it deals with, you know, um, uh, I think assessing you know, the supply chains, uh, forward looking into the future on what, because we're at the development stage yeah. right now at this point. Um, so just looking to see what materials are needed um, and we actually perform an assessment on a lot of our components and materials uh, last year, um, identified our number one risk. Um, with this CHIPS Act, I think um, uh, having been in the semiconductor you know, in, you know, industry when I first started my career, um, and then it moving away, you know, uh, losing, I think, domestic supply chain for those components. Um, with this act, bringing it back to the U.S., I think that lessens our risk of, of uh, dealing with counterfeit, uh, you know, uh, items, um, which, you know, we've implemented, I think a lot of companies have implemented, you know, con uh, you know counterfeit avoidance programs, but I think that actually um, strengthens us um, uh, domestically to, uh, you know, I guess, you know, gain, you know, reassert ourselves on the, I think, the in leadership uh, role in, um, on a global scale, you know, to be able to, Manufacture um, supply uh, uh, semiconductors um, domestically. So. Ben, I want to turn back to you quickly. Uh, you know, you mentioned that you know at DIU you're working on a lot of the, the technologies that can possibly you know resolve you know some of these supply chain constraints. Um, and I'm also struck by the fact that DoD and DIU in particular has long been a an early adopter of these technologies of, of technologies. You know, microgrids being one of them, solar being an, another one. Um, when you, in that way, DIU can almost be a, a, an interesting additional pillar to these public support mechanisms we're seeing emerge as the United States tries to support clean energy technology. What does your public-private partnership model look like? How do you work with the private sector uh, to you know, leverage your research, your research and your innovations to, to private markets and support companies like National Grid and or Terra Power and others? So for DIU, um, you know, we're kind of uh, we're supposed to make it easy to work with the government. That's our goal. Um, you know, most people do say it's relatively easy to work with DIU. 
Um, we still have some of the bureaucracy that comes with being part of the government. Um, we do get complimented by, by many people tell us we, they don't think we're part of the government, so I think that's a compliment when they, when they deal with us. Um, but uh, we use OTAs, other transaction authorities, so non-FAR based contracting, uh, which is a, is a simpler, easier way to, to work. It's, it's a really, really, literally like a blank sheet of paper from a negotiating standpoint. You don't have the 150 rules in the federal acquisition regulations that you need to go through and deal with um, for, for contracting with the government. Um, it's, it's, it's as simple as going to our website, uh, diu.mil, looking at active solicitations and responding to that. Um, five pages or less, 15 slides or less, it's really meant to be a pitch, a pitch deck type response from companies, make it very easy to kind of get in the door. Uh, and then it's a competitive down select process you know, from that where you'd actually do a, 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 what used to be in person, obviously now mostly video uh, pitches. Um, and then you know we try to do multiple awards and then go through a what we call a prototyping uh, phase. The real key to it though is if you get through that process and you get a uh, letter from us saying that you've met all the requirements of that pr uh, prototyping uh, phase, you can get a five-year non-competitive FAR or non-FAR based contract with, with DIU or one of our DOD, DOD partners and that could be used across all of DOD and USG. So lots of success stories I could talk about uh, on that front. Um, but really, it, it is supposed to make it easier for commercial companies to, to work with, with us. Um, getting back to that thesis before about making things you know, better, faster, cheaper to work with the government. Uh, there's benefits for you know, private industry and the government on that side, but things like the CHIPS Act, things like um, the IRA, um, what's important there for us is, is, um, is, is the fact that the biggest challenge I have uh, with working with uh, private industry is, is some of the supply chain things where some of the traditional defense contractors have certain supply chains, not that they don't have their own challenges, uh, have certain supply chains that are organized in a certain fashion uh, that allows them to work more easily with the government. Uh, what the IRA and the CHIPS Act is doing is by bringing more onshoring, by looking at kind of our allies and partners that we're working with, um, investing in certain technologies will ultimately make what uh, uh, what DIU is trying to do in our outreach to the commercial sector easier and faster and better for, for, for all parties. Um, and you know, just, just like Autumn, I, I have some history with the um, semiconductors too, so uh, it's nice to see this finally starting to move forward with the CHIPS Act. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you mentioned you know, part of your process is uh, almost that awareness of the insights into the supply chains from those, from those candidates applying to this space. Autumn, I think you, you mentioned that you know, your work is so forward, you're, you know, your next gen nuclear technology is so forward looking, you're able to do that supply chain assessment a little bit in advance. Right. But, Joe, I might I might turn to you. That strikes me as a little bit more complicated for you. Do if anything purely to uh, the lack of transparency, particularly like the minerals upstream of those supply chains. How do you manage that uncertainty and, and build that really insightful vision into understanding your supply chain risk? Yeah, it's a crystal ball. Um, <laughs> I bought it off of eBay. No, it's you know I mean really if you look over the the, the short term, just over the last. 15, 18 months, take, take out of it all the, the geopolitical um, you know, challenges that we've seen. I mean, really, you know, from a commodity standpoint, I mean, everything as simple as you know, Suez Canal getting blocked up, right? And, and so it, it really is, I mean, you know, from our business and, and you know, again, from a, from a global standpoint of what we need to pull into the United States in order to, to be successful around um, you know, renewables deployment, whether we're talking you know, batteries, whether we're talking you know, solar, uh, or wind, um, you know, it's really the, the tides that, you know, and so from, from that standpoint, trying to create strong partnerships, again, both domestically and, you know, globally um, is, is important. Um, but, but again, at the end of the day, those type of force majeure events uh, are gonna happen in the industry when you're back towards, you know, the, the end of it and, and trying to, to make that execution happen. And, and so from that standpoint, it's just having some good, you know, thinkers, you know, especially, you know, in this room, we've got a lot of, of that, you know, with, with military background and, and you're trying to solve a problem that's happening in real time mm -hmm. and, and, you know, coming up with what that solution is. So, uh, and we've seen a lot of that, you know, recently and we've been able to successfully, you know, kind of, kind of move through it, um, you know, but again, when you're, you're talking about pandemics and what it did to ports, when you're talking about, you know, labor shortages on, on offload and you're talking about some of the other challenges we've seen with logistics and things like that. It just seems to kind of be, all right, what's, what's it gonna be this week? Mm -hmm. And figure out how to move through it. So, but, but strong partnerships with those manufacturers is gonna be key, mm -hmm. um, without a doubt, so. It's, uh, it's embedding resilience through those partnerships, mm -hmm. it sounds like. Uh, John, I might turn to you again to blow this out to the, almost a macro level. 
uh, and ask you, I mean, Joe said, you know, let's put the, put the geopolitics aside for a minute, but I'm gonna put them right back in. Because <laughs> I, I think ultimately when we're talking about these issues around supply chain resiliency, sure. you know, Autumn mentioned Halu, so you're talking about Russia there. For a lot of those other mineral and material supply chains, we're talking about China, and as Richard said, you know, that's the, that's the geostrategic competition at hand. We also heard the congressman mention countervailing tariffs, right, against China as part of, you know, the overall strategic calculus in terms of how we build these more resilient supply chains. That said, right, the, the amount of weight that uh, China has in the supply chain will take time to dislodge. That's not necessarily a light switch we can turn on. Sure. Off. How do we effectively uh, manage uh, building resiliency into, into alternative supply chains, right? Keeping costs you know, low while still rapidly uh, deploying these technologies in order to meet our clean energy technology goals. It's almost a, a shift on the trilemma that Julia, Julia was talking about during yeah. her fireside chat. Well, that's a total softball, obviously. I mean, yeah. I think we're, we'll, yeah. we'll be able to crush this. Well, one. I gave it to you. Yeah, thank you, thank you, much appreciated. Um, so I think one of the things that's last, lacking right now is that we're still taking a piecemeal approach to how we're, we're trying to tackle these strategic level issues, mm -hmm. which in and of itself is, I think, a, str a flawed strategy, mm -hmm. right? And that's, that's not pointing a finger at anybody in particular. It's, that's really a collective need that we have to address more systematically. And so an example that I would point to is that when we're talking about the clean energy transition and the types of things that need to be done, a lot of it ends up happening on a one size fits one approach, right? We're gonna try and solve this problem for either this specific component of the supply chain, or we're gonna fix the, the requirements for this particular type of client or this particular type of customer or this particular type of technology. And I think what we're missing in the process of doing so is really trying to understand where the pressures exist in the constraints associated with deploying the types of solutions that we want to get out there. So whether it's renewables or when we're talking about SMRs or, or nuclear technology, right now the, the, the way that the system is, is set up, when I say the system, I'm talking about the bulk electric system in North America, it's not set up for that, right? We're, we're still taking a piecemeal approach to a national scale problem. So if you think about things like the, the, the lack of, of HVDC ties and transmission systems that enable a greater capability to share mm -hmm. renewable resources that are geographically disparate, as an example, or if we have the backbone of the system that's capable of receiving the type of advanced nuclear technology that's there to really harness the true capabilities of it, those types of conversations need to happen because when you're having those conversations, you start to see these little points of pressure that exist in terms of how you tackle it. China understands, and Russia both understands, that we can't make that transition turn on a dime. Mm -hmm. They're betting on the fact that it's going to be uh, politically challenging, it's going to be economically challenging, and it's going to be technically challenging to be able to get there, and they're counting on us not taking a strategic approach. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that we're going to continue this piecemeal process of saying like, you know, play the whack-a-mole of like, let's try and fix this one problem at a time and then we'll fix this one problem at a time. And so I think where we find ourselves, and to tie it back to really the national security theme of, of what we're identifying right now, national security is a unifying principle that has the ability to focus this conversation in a productive way. Mm -hmm. So when you say all customers everywhere, it's way too obtuse, right? You're just, you're trying to fix everybody's problem at the same time. If you look at it, within the context of identifying specific national security requirements that have this dependence on energy resources, you have now taken a, a very abstract concept and put it into a very, very specific viewpoint of saying, okay, you can't solve it for everybody all the time immediately, but what if we took this and looked at what it would require from a technological standpoint, from a contracting standpoint, I'm so glad you mentioned OTAs as an example, which is this is an OTA-sized problem, mm -hmm. right? That's why that contracting mechanism exists. You use it for the Apollo program. You use it for developing a vaccines. You can use it to try and tackle an energy security and national security problem because it's timely and important. Then I think we're, we're, we're in a different spot of being able to say, not just generically what do we need to do to get there, but what can we do to support some specific energy resilience needs mm -hmm in the context of national security, we can start to, to really identify these things one at a time. And of course, I think when you say, you know, 
the national security argument can be a really strong framing mechanism, not just in terms of you know, creating the unifying for level of effort within the US government, but also to a point you were making, Joe, about the search for partnerships, right? National security concerns and, and the development of like-minded friends, partners, and allies, which we see happening on, you know, across the clean energy supply chain beyond the United States, can be an effective, uh, you know, again, framing by which to begin developing those partnerships. Joe, I, I might press you a bit, you know, when you talk about building those partnerships, who are you looking towards, both within, with, domestically within the United States, but also, uh, and that's like a tee up for, for <laughs> Ben in a way, uh, but also internationally, because I think, again, when we talk about geostrategic competition, right, it has to be a conversation of like-minded partners and allies, not something that the United States can or should necessarily seek to take China on on its own, for example. Yeah, that's, um, it, it's a good question, because I think it's, it's, it's got, a, you know, a couple different spokes kind of coming out of that. You know, one is definitely, you know, from an offtake standpoint, right? So it's it's those partnerships and and making sure that we're we're creating those. You know, as talked about earlier, whether it be with you know power purchase agreements or CNI type deals. Um, the second thing is obviously from a supply standpoint, mm -hmm. right? Um, also the installation, the experience, and and um, from you know from a, a and, and, and then I guess I would say in regards to responsible sourcing, you know, so when we talk about labor, we talk about materials that, that you know, get that, get that labor to the actual finished product. So you know, there's, a, there's a couple different, you know, talking points there. Again, from a domestic standpoint and driving to being motivated on, on the mining side, being motivated on the manufacturing side, that, that to me is a political issue, right? And, and you can see our country is extremely divided in that regard. Again, whether you talk about conventional resources, um, you know, and, and what we've utilized, you know, to date or we're trying to transition away from. And, and to me, that's one that I think is gonna take some time, you know, maybe more from a strategic standpoint, as you mentioned, right? Um, and getting people comfortable with that, right? Um, and and that, that ability to, to start to, to change the thinking around that I think is going to be a, a big deal in order to be able to create the partnerships that are more localized, right, with, within our borders. But then again, bigger picture, um, what I have to look at from actually being able to deploy and execute on things is, you know, and it might be more tactical than strategic, but it's, it's schedule, it's timing, it's, it's logistics, it's cost. Yep. Certainly cost is a big component of it as well. And so, you know, making sure that, that we've got a diverse yet responsible, you know, approach to, to who we're working with. Um, you know, 48 hours from now, I'm gonna be up in Perrysburg, Ohio, um, you know, in a, at a module manufacturing facility there, um, which is domestic, and that, that's a great story and, and a strong partner of ours. But then, you know, we're, we're talking about, you know, some of the things that are just starting to gain momentum. We don't have that, you know, here yet locally, whether you talk about, you know, the semiconductors. And so, again, having to have those partners, you know, whether they're coming from Europe or other places, in order to be able to still deploy on, on you know, some of the goals that we have, um, you know, here in the near term. So I want to actually, I'm, Autumn, I'm going to come to you, but I first want to turn to, to Ben, because you nodded your head when, when Joe mentioned, you know, the strategic, the strategic vision and the tactical kind of needs that you see here. What does DI, what role does DIU play in balancing those two needs from the private sector? And then I think I want to turn to Autumn because we're looking again towards building those partnerships with a little bit more lead time. Whereas National Grid, we have these technologies now. We're trying to make sure those supply chains are resilient now. Yeah, I mean, so DIU executes on a daily basis at the tactical level with projects that we're working on with various technologies. Um, but we always have an eye on that strategic issue is because we're looking inherent in our missions like the health of the national security innovation base. So we're always trying to make our investments in, in the commercial sector, uh, working with companies, trying to move them forward with certain technologies that can help out with some of these strategic issues and, and move that forward. DUD by itself is, it doesn't have enough of a market share in this energy transition uh, to, to be able to you know, sway the market one way or another by itself but we can uh, definitely get out there ahead of things and, and, and shine the light on certain paths to, to help open some doors. Uh, we've done things on the regulatory front uh, for advanced aviation with electric uh, vertical and takeoff uh, aircraft, for example. Joby was one of our first investments, if you've heard of that company before, four or five years ago. Uh, we worked with, with, with them and you know, their biggest challenge was with the FAA, getting uh, flight hours. They couldn't get flight hours. Well, you know, if you go uh, west of the Mississippi, about half that land is the federal government land. A lot of that's military land. And uh, if you want to get flight hours there, you, 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 come, you come to DUD and, and we, we can sign off on your flight hours. And uh, Joe Ben, the CEO of, of Joby, has, has spoken to this about how much 
DIU and DOD has really helped accelerate that marketplace. We can do similar things with things like long duration storage and other things. We're not gonna move the entire market, but you know, you heard, heard your kid talking about you know, the long duration storage and the investments we could make and the huge impact. We've got like 500 installations around the world for DOD. Um, most of these are roughly kind of size of small towns. Some of these are quite large. Think of Camp Pendleton in Southern California, very, very large ins installations. Um, we have a lot of data centers. Uh, we've got a lot of hospitals, we a lot of things. All of those could use these investments in long duration storage. Uh, you think about things like uh, Texas and the power grid issues we had in Texas. While um, you know, it, it would you know, it would have been good if we're not a drain on the grid when the power went down. We've got about 25 bases in, in Texas. Uh, it would be more ideal if we can push power back into the grid uh, dur during, the, during, the, during that time. And, and because it's also inherent to the DoD mission that we have humanitarian assistance and disaster relief, we need to be able to deploy resources in instances like that and get out there and have those vehicles that can do vehicle to grid type, type things and take our tactical and commercial vehicles off that base and go plug into those hospitals and everything else to keep things going and keep, keep those uh, uh, localities uh, and support them. So, you know, we're not gonna, we can do individual projects and help move things along and help technologies and, and help move money more efficiently and, and, and smarter from a government perspective. Um, you know, but the big, the big strategic shifts are still going to happen back in the Pentagon. You know, we're just this little outpost out there in Silicon Valley. You know, I give you, so. give yourself some <laughs> little mom and pop shop. <laughs> just a little <laughs> mom and pop shop, just yeah, a little, little valley enough. in Northern California. Uh, Autumn, uh, you know, turning to you now, I think uh, this question of partnership building, mm -hmm. I think, is hugely important, particularly because when you, you know, as we we discussed earlier on, you know, your big supply chain risk is is where do we get this Halu from? Right. Uh, obviously, the major source of that Halu is now currently doing unspeakable things by invading, right. by violating all the international norms that we previously based you know, free trade upon. Mm -hmm. So when you look at building the partnerships necessary to uh, create a sustainable, resilient supply chain, mm -hmm. how is TerraPower thinking of that? And what are the considerations you're making? So um, in 2020, mm -hmm. the, the, um, the uh, DOE was authorized by the engineering, uh, what the energy, Act of 2020 um, to establish um, HALU availability program. Um, so uh, I, I think they see the need, and I, I'm getting to the point, right? That's but um, so they see the need that we don't have enough HALU to uh, on a commercial scale mm -hmm. to fuel advanced nuclear reactors. Mm -hmm we will not have you know <laughs> nuclear advanced nuclear reactors without it um uh, so uh that part I, I think that doe's developing that program um seeking out um uh those that can produce commercial scale halu um terra power is is also on the back end um helping to you know invest in those companies to uh, uh, say create more of it at the right time for us to use um, um, in, in the future. Uh, so it, it's really key, I think, developing those, those partnerships is really key to the, to the success of our program and um, uh, which is a demonstration, uh, which is you know at the demonstration um, phase, but uh, we're looking, you know, to sell those on uh, those plants going forward. So we need Halu now for our, you know, project, but also going, you know, to help uh, replace, you know, our current nuclear um, technology today. So um, it's really essential. Of course. Uh, so and I want to give anybody in the audience who wishes to ask a question, raise your hand and uh, head on up to the microphone. Um, Otherwise, I'm just going to keep asking supply chain questions, which I'm happy to do. But you know, we might not head in the most useful direction for y'all. Um, I'm interested in you know Joe and Autumn. One of the things, and actually, frankly, everyone on this panel has brought up some form of localization and reshoring. And when we talk about the supply chain, uh, that inherently you know brings up this good political narrative around job creation here in the United States, right? And I think when you're talking again, John, to your point about the national security prerogative here, the the integration of the defense community, right, and getting involved in that space. You know, we're at a we're, we're at a this convening is designed to engage that that veteran, that that military, you know, talent, right? 
how do you how do you effectively use that talent pool, which understands the national security prerogative, uh, is locally based already? How do you plug in those two those two pieces to work more effectively together? Uh, I might I'll start with I'll start with John on this one since I've been bullying him on the China. Talk a bit <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I, it's a. It, it's probably the most important thing that we can talk about, especially within the context of who's in the room and, and what we can really emphasize. So I think it's, it's a combination of understanding what type, we, military veterans have seen resilience in a number of different aspects from a number of different perspectives. Mine was as a tanker escorting fuel convoys in Iraq in 2004, five and six. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have to go very far and take a long leap of logic to understand that the energy resilience of the system that we were supporting was horrible, right? It was just like, okay, let's put 505 gallons of JP-8 into yeah. a tank so that we can drive down to escort a fuel truck to get back up to the base so we can put fuel in it to go guard pipelines so that we can get the product out so that it can be refined into JP-8 to put in the tank to bring it back up to the base. So not a great strategy, right? Uh, and we also saw that um, that was an imperative that drove a lot of innovation of trying to understand expeditionary power in a completely different way than we had looked at before. And if anybody has any questions as to whether or not this is a big deal in modern warfare, Ukraine and, and Russia is a perfect example of how they have not solved that problem. And it has been the Achilles heel of modern military is whether or not they can project force based on the availability of energy. Mm -hmm. So that's just from a messaging standpoint. But when we talk about how veterans can integrate themselves into it, they're inherently carrying that perspective and that knowledge into the work that they can potentially do in the energy field. And the most common mistake I see, I did not come to energy because I was an electrical engineer by trade, right? There's, there's nothing in my history that would indicate that I should be working in energy right now, right? But the difference is understanding that there's a perspective and a passion that comes with recognizing an imperative in a different way than just the traditional like, well, well, is there, is there a, an opportunity to be had in this particular field? Or do I have a level of technical expertise um, that just seems suited for it, so I'll go ahead and do it. I, I really wanna shift the narrative about the way in which we engage veteran communities to be able to do it, because if you take Texas as an example, the level of disruption that happened on DOD installations for communications, electricity, and water service hopefully serves as the canary in the coal mine of like, this is a really big deal. We're not ready for it right now. And, oh, by the way, if we just light up the installation like a Christmas tree and we solve, solve that problem of mission assurance, we actually didn't because 60% of the pe personnel live off the installation. All your people are out there, all the military families are out there, and all the civilians that run all of those systems on the base, they also live off base. So you're, you're not fixing the problem by just fixing it for like one little boundary. If you can take that community approach that manifests very literally around de defense communities, channel that into what we're trying to do from an energy perspective, mm -hmm. that's the value the veterans are providing to what we're trying to accomplish here because they've seen it. Mm -hmm. And of course, I think one of the other pieces of that is just as much as the veteran community is bringing in that, that real sense of the national security urgency here, yeah. uh, bringing that to a, a clean energy technology company like a TerraPower or like a National Grid actually can help DOD solve those problems and turn on the back end as well, which is equally easy. I mean, uh, whether that be de for deploying an SMR, or something like Project Pele, right, to electrify the battle space, we yeah. can get into that. That's a, that's a whole other conference, not just a sub-question of the <laughs> panel. Right. But I, I think I want to turn, I want to give the rest of the panel the opportunity to ask this question, and then I see a question there in the audience. So uh, let's go to Autumn. How do you think about these issues around localization, job creation, in terms of the narrative that TerraPower brings to uh, you know, the conversation on its role in the energy transition? So yeah, um, definitely uh, small businesses uh, as our focus is making sure we uh, you know, get small business particip participation. Um, I, I work for the government and um, so I, I'm very familiar with the, you know, aware that our small businesses are employing more, employ more people in you know, the United States than large businesses. So we wanna make sure we're focusing on getting them um, the resources um, they need to sustain, you know, or uh, even uh, or expand their, you know, their uh, capacity um, through, you know, you know, connecting them with um, the the loan programs that the government has, um, um, things of, you know, that. Sort of thing. Joe. 
Uh, same, same question to you. you know, you're all over the place. You just mentioned, you were talking earlier about where you're headed after this conference, right? Yeah. So you're in, you're in small town America seeing this job creation on yep. a regular basis. Yep. How do you see that unfolding further as a result of this trade conversation? And again, to, to reintroduce the, the veterans component to how you think about that job creation. Yeah, I might focus on, on the back end. So actually, you know, out in, you know, out on the project. So, you know, many of our projects have at, at peak roughly four, five, six hundred, you know, workers on site. And so when you think about, you know, what it takes to, you know, to actually complete the installation, do it in a quality manner, do it in a safe manner. Um, you know, you know, talk about, you know, people that, that I served with that, you know, that, that are in this room. Um, you know, to me, that, that's a huge plus, knowing, you know, coming in, they've got a level of, of background of, um, you know, have, have kind of done and seen, you know what I mean, some, some, some difficult things can think on their, you know, those are the type of qualities when we talk about maybe the, the installation side, right? So maybe more on the tactical and, and actually, you know, doing it out in the field, you know, you're, you're out in it, you're, you've got your boots dirty. And I mean, you know, for a lot of us, that's, that's ultimately what we live for, right? Um, being able to, you know, get, you know, get direction, you know, get a, you know, get, get some parameters and then have to think on our feet, have to understand that it's got to be done in a quality manner. It's got to be done on time. It's got to be done, you know, in a safe manner and then making sure that, that that's how, you know, it's actually carried out. And so I, I like to look at it from that standpoint. Again, we talked earlier about the IRA, um, and, and, you know, talked about that domestic, that, you know, prevailing wage, the apprenticeship type conditions that are actually in there specific to, you know, what my, my organization does. To me, that, that's, a, that, that's a huge, you know, benefit to, to actually getting that craft trained up. Um, and, you know, from, from a veteran standpoint, again, a lot of where we are at are, are in some more of these small rural areas like you had mentioned and, and can tie in pretty well from that standpoint. So. Definitely. Yeah. Ben, I want to give you the opportunity to jump in on this question around job creation and, and engagement with the veterans, even though I imagine it's more closely tied to your public-private partnership uh, work. Right. I mean, uh, DIU, Defense Innovation Unit, we, you know, most of the companies we work with, about 60, 70 percent are small businesses. And in that category, we do work with some, you know, bigger entities. Google's one of our portfolio companies, not technically a small company. Um, but uh, we, you know, most of our awards go to small companies. A lot of veterans in those companies that, that are, are there. Uh, because they're they're innovative, they 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 were seeking those opportunities to kind of drive things forward. Like John, I was there in Iraq in the early 2000s. I remember the miles of fuel fuel line. We could have actually gone faster. We had to slow down because we had to get fuel. So the the the, the kind of those issues are you know you can look at veterans. They've been through this. Some of those innovative people in, in the world I've ever worked with, or, or the young Marines I've worked with in, early in my career, um, they find solutions. Um, and and so that whole veteran community tapping into that. Is, um, is a great opportunity. We seek that out in, in some of the, the companies we work with. Um, and on the energy side, I mean, there's a deep appreciation, I think, that was kind of what John was alluding to about the challenges with contested logistics. Mm -hmm. What Secretary Mattis talked about was, you know, releasing us from the tether of fuel, those types of things, um, whether or not that's hydrogen or synthetic fuels or, or other things out there. Um, those, are, those are big areas where uh, there's a lot of reasons for, for DOD to invest in right now. And, and you know, other areas that we're very interested in and looking at those innovative technologies around like dis distributed energy resources and stuff. I mean, that, that trend line in, in, um, in the energy sector right now is a really great opportunity for us to address some of our operational energy mm -hmm. issues. And of course, where DOD does invest, it becomes just another demand signal for that alternative yep. supply chain activity, which again, talking about a process of loosening that grip that, uh, you know, some of our uh, more cantankerous global partners, let's say, might you know, are, are are ultimately hurting the resiliency of our clean energy deployment and economic uh, clean energy economic goals. But let's turn to our first audience question over here. Please introduce yourself uh, and your affiliation, please. Hi, thanks. My name is Laura Schmiegel. I'm a senior vice president at Orion Talent, and I have almost a follow up to that question. So thank you for that. Um, I'm moderating a panel this afternoon with um, government and. Um, training providers for veterans who want to get into clean energy and we're going to discuss um, all the issues around how to get more veterans into these jobs but we don't have any employers on the panel so my question is um, John what you were saying about uh, connecting the pain points right there's going to be this flood of new investment new jobs everything else we're focused on Interide Orion on training technicians and operators to go out and work into the field at the junior enlisted level but it would be very helpful to know and anticipate where those 
labor pain points and workforce development pain points are going to happen in the industry so that we can be prepared to send the veterans where the work is needed and kind of start talking to them early about where that work's going to be needed. So how can companies like ours, how can the government providers that are on my panel work with industry to kind of anticipate those needs and make sure that we're filling them as you need them and not stay one step behind all the time? That's a fantastic question. Uh, I might I'm, I'm going to stick that with, with, with John first. <laughs> Sorry. Sure. And then we'll go, we'll go to, no, we'll go to Autumn and Joe. Uh, I remember my transition off of active duty, and it was a shit show. Pardon my French. It was a total mess, right? Trying to figure out, like, what do I want to be when I grow up? Because I thought I knew what I wanted to be when I grew up, but now I want to do something different, and I don't know what that thing is. And, and trying to figure that piece of it out. Um, right now, I think the demand signal on clean energy is so strong. The hard part is, like, sorting out where those opportunities manifest and in what areas it's most compatible with the types of skill sets and the passions that people have. So I think a lot of it is focused on technical skill, and rightfully so, right? The translatability of what people are learning in the military and wanting to be able to channel that into what they do. The real question is whether or not that aligns with the passion for what they're most interested in and really contributing to. And so a couple of things that I would offer up. One, don't un underestimate the importance of non-traditional education or associations that provide at least a greater level of awareness as to what's happening in this particular space. Otherwise, they kind of find themselves on a similar like funnel that DOD provided them of like, these are the skills that you have to have. You get like the suffocation by certification, and you're going to do like all of these specific things, and then you're going to be the trigger puller that we need you to be in DOD. I think the different question is when we look at the varied needs associated with the companies that would be hiring veterans into clean energy, in the vast majority of instances, the technical piece is one only one of or it might actually not be the driving reason why they need them in there. Mm -hmm. It could be around the organizational management skills. It could be around bringing a diversity of viewpoints into an organization that has not placed the right level of emphasis on these kind of these types of issues that we're talking about in the panel right now. And so what I would really encourage you to do is, is try and find those opportunities just like you're doing here today. And or, there are so many different advocacy organizations that are trying to bridge these gaps and make sure that the right narratives are actually appearing in those discussions that are trying to capture both that blend of technical capability that they've developed in the military, but also identify the passion areas that they really want to grow into. I want to, yeah, uh, Joe, I was actually thinking about coming to you mainly because you yep. mentioned you're looking for both that tactical, but also yep. that strategic kind of framing. Yeah, and, and I think one of the, the, the best opportunities coming forward is that, that, that workforce that, that likes to be out there working with their hands, right? Getting their boots dirty, putting in you know, that full, full, full day's work and coming home and, and feeling like something was accomplished. And so we talked, you know, about strategic partnerships. And you know, from from our standpoint, or my, you know, my company, we have a pipeline that we look out three, five, seven years. And so logistically, you know, where are those areas that we're looking, that we're originating in, that ultimately we're going to be building these projects? Or so you know, we're talking about then the, the need for the boots on the ground. And and although you know, National Grid Renewables doesn't specifically hire and self-perform, we hire what, what we consider to be EPC contractors. And so if you look on Bloomberg or Wood McKenzie, what have you, you know, they'll have a list of the top 20 contractors you know, in the renewable space, whether it's wind or solar deployment. And so then you know, those names that, that are at the top of those lists, that to me, you know, whether you, you come through a company like myself and say, OK, you know, logistically, where are you guys looking at? You know what I mean? Texas, Rust Belt, you know, the Dakotas, whatever it may be. And then two, the actual contractors that then we partner with that, that you know, will be doing that, that work, needing that workforce. And, and, you know, so from that standpoint, you know, kind of creating, you know, a bit of a, of a triangle in relationship um, is, is what I'm trying to create from my standpoint, yeah. Autumn, I want to give you a chance to weigh in on this as well. In a way, we're talking about, a, you know, assessing your supply chain of human capital right out 10, mm -hmm. 10 or so years. How, do you, how are you thinking about these issues in relation to that question? So, so it's, I think identifying the talent and, and ensuring that talent has the right you know, education that is needed to fill those positions. We currently have uh, tens, uh, you know, uh, uh, quite a few positions open now and we can't fill people 
you know, they'll fill those people because those, you know, the, the individuals I think that are applying to the job aren't necessarily um, uh, have that background or training that we need to, you know, for them to have to be able to, you know, uh, to offer them the position. So I think, to your point, is making sure that, you know, they are, they can't, they're trained or, um, or you know, have the skill set to be able to fill those positions. Um, but also maybe looking out um, uh, on, say, Sam.gov or something like that. I mean, those are opportunities that are out there that the government has, and they're and and those contractors, those awardees, they're going to need, you know, you know, just this is just a suggestion, but uh, they're going to need, you know, contractors to uh, or you know the contractors who are being awarded these contracts are going to need employees to you know do the work so maybe that could be a way to um, get those those people in the right areas when needed but I know for our situation it's, it's all about tech, you know having the ba right background yeah Ben yeah and, and just you know I have dozens of portfolio companies that we're working with right now most of which never thought they'd have a government contract you know because that's kind of the model we're going after right and all of a sudden they do and they see the opportunity and the growth there so i would be more than happy to get you engaged with them because you know hiring veterans to kind of make that connection help grow that business the ideal diu company that we work with has about 10 20 percent of their business with the government we still want them to focus on the commercial sector but that's still a good chunk is 20 percent of your business is with the government and they still need to hire for people that are going to work in those areas and veterans would would love that technology and, and still be able to help the mission Thank you. Great. Uh, we got about just a few minutes left. Uh, I want to kind of do one. Oh, do we have another question? Oh, so many questions. You got a line. We got a lot. We got a There's whole. A line. That's a line, a line in the back. Many questions. All right. Uh, I thought there was a bar on that side. Of yeah. The for a hot second. Carolina. That's next. Uh, Kevin Boer, I'm, I'm with Deloitte. Uh, question for Ben: uh, What's the expectation for you, and how do you balance between being the experimental sandbox or having to land every project successfully? Um, DIU roughly works right now at about a. 45% transition rate, which in the ecosystem of innovation groups inside DOD is really well, because I think we're averaging around 11% amongst the, the, the other players, so we're doing relatively well there. Um, definitions of transition or what's a successful project, that goal line keeps seeming to, seems to move. Um, at DIU, we're starting to use the, 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 the terms of adoption, less concerned about whether or not they landed with that particular contract or that particular thing, and more about was it actually adopted and, and being used. So actually going back to the company, maybe like how many orders did you get? Um, because companies can get government contracts, IDIQs, and other things, and then actually not have any revenue coming in. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very focused on that. We, we call companies that we work with portfolio companies because um, there's a lot at DIU where we kind of model that VC kind of environment, but we're not a VC. We're not taking equity stakes. It's non-dilutive. We're buying wares for these companies. Uh, so we're very, you know, but, but in that vein of a portfolio company, we're, we're concerned about that company's success. So we're looking at how that, you know, what regulatory hurdles are they running into? What contracting issues are they running into? What kind of growth and scaling issues? What kind of hiring issues are they run, running into? So it's that same kind of type of process to make sure those companies are successful. So you know, it, there's a full gamut of what we call success, from like you know working with a company initially and kind of moving through, uh, working with the Hill, working with the DoD budget office. You want us to start a project? Great. Have you actually funded it over the five-year budget plan that you have? Um, there's a lot of that. As you, if you've, anybody's worked with the government, we do a lot of initial, like, here's a little bit of money. Well, is it in the budget for the next five years? No. Well, then just, you know, valley of death type, type stuff. So we're constantly kind of hitting it. In the energy space, it's great right now because there's such an emphasis on climate um, coming down from the White House that, that that's an area where, like, here's all my climate projects. It fits into a climate category. You want to align it with the budget that the president wants to push, put but forward. Do you ever get any pressure to be more experimental? And um, find, find new avenues. Yes and no. I mean, it, we we cover a spectrum of if you know like the technology readiness stuff of like four or five up to nine. So it just depends on the on the technology. Um, I've got I, I I literally have projects coming from electric jet skis to geothermal plants right now. Um, so uh, I, I also have a project on a new uh, advanced aircraft blended wing body that that just closed. So I, I don't know what's more extreme from electric jet skis to geothermal or, or uh, new aviation. So, yes, we're pushing the envelope from new technologies, but it's it's it we run the gamut of, of of different things. DIU has a fusion project right now, so which is always five years out, right? So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. 
we go. Greg, are you in line for a question? Yeah, I got a question. All righty. Okay, uh, Greg Duque. Uh, question is for Joe. Um, so we're talking about energy transition, right, which requires baseline energy, which requires a secure grid. Um, secure grid is threatened by climate perils. Climate perils are becoming more common and more violent and destructive. What's the National Grid doing to anticipate climate perils down the road and bake it into your capital plan? So, yeah, I, and, and National Grid Renewables is, a, is an offset of, of National Grid, um, global uh, transmission operator out of, the, out of the UK. We have a venture arm based in the United States, and, and so we deploy their, their renewable goals um, within the, the greater picture. So from, from our standpoint, you know, National Grid, um, very similar to other, you know, IPPs and, and public transmission operators, you know, have goals from, you know, from decarbonization and, and the like. And, and so that's what, that's what we're working to deploy. The, the challenge is, is that, you know, we can, we can originate a project, we can, you know, get it executed. And, and I think you're, you, you might have been referring to grid as my company versus the electric grid, I'm assuming, or were you referring to the electric grid? Both, yeah, and so that that is, and I mentioned earlier that that's one of the big challenges is is on the federal side and and those upgrades, right? And and what we're doing around that. And so right now, when you look at at the deployment, that's probably one of the single biggest challenges. Whether you look at specific RTOs, MISO, you know, SPP, PJM, and and you know, ERCOT and the like, um, KISO out on the West Coast is is that challenge right there and getting through the cycles of, or at least what we call cycles, to actually you know, be able to, to get those interconnect agreements is what we need in order to be able to actually deploy that to the national grid, not my company, but you know, within, within the United States. And, and that's probably the biggest challenge. So we've had projects, very good projects, um, and again, with, with landowners and, and procurement line of sight and, and what have you, um, you know, even offtake, but we don't have that interconnect agreement. And so from that standpoint, that's probably one of the biggest biggest challenges is, is again working back through FERC and and the RTOs and and trying to get that part of it cleaned up each kind of has their own way of tackling you know how they get through the studies and everything else um, but if you look at that backup in in each of those RTO areas that's probably one of our biggest challenges to ultimately meeting the goals that that we're talking about here so yeah it's a great question I want to we're over time but I want to give each of our panelists one last opportunity because this is a wide-reaching subject matter area where we didn't touch about anything. I, for example, thought midway through, oh my gosh, we got to talk about cyber resilience of the supply chain and where that, that veteran's experience also from working with DOD can also be helpful. But going down the line, Ben, let's start with you. Any, any areas we didn't, we didn't touch on? What are your key takeaways from this session? Oh, it's uh, one, thank you for Atlanta Council and, and, and for letting us do this today. Um, I, I would just say any companies out there that are interested in engaging with DIU, please reach out, energy at diu.mil. Um, it's how, how you find us, it's as simple as that. Um, and uh, you know, just think of us as kind of a market maker. We're, we, we are out, we're reaching out to our DOD partners about the challenges they're facing, and we're reaching out to the commercial industry about what solutions they have, and then, and then we try to make something happen from a, um, a solicitation and, and, and go from there. Mm -hmm. so. John, any final word? Uh, thanks, I wanna echo that. Thanks for the opportunity to have this discussion, because honestly, you don't, you don't really get a chance to mix it up this way on a regular basis, but it's so important that we do so. And what I would really say is just making sure that you're, you're identifying and taking advantage of the opportunities to put this, really apply this lens that we've talked through today on a regular basis, not just as like an academic exercise to be able to do it, but really apply it in the context of, of how we approach our respective roles throughout this value chain that we're trying to identify here. So I think if you do that, we'll find a lot more common ground than we've been able to find right now where it has to be about winners and losers within our own processes and between our own companies. I think this is where we're gonna find common ground. So thanks for the conversation. Surely. Uh, Joe, any final thoughts? Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity to, to be a part of the conversation and, and the, uh, the room here today. Um, from, you know, from our standpoint, we've got a lot of great thinkers here, a lot of great companies represented. And again, when you talk about renewables deployment, it, it actually has a very high cost of production, both monetarily and from a resource standpoint. And so solving some of those problems, whether we're talking about raw materials or then we're talking about the process to actually get those manufactured in, into the goods that, that we then deploy 
um, you know, that, that I think is one of the biggest opportunities is to kind of help decrease that, that cost of production. Mm -hmm. Autumn, nope. any last thoughts? No, uh, thank you for having me. All right, well hey, I've uh, managed to steal four minutes and 30 seconds of your lunch break. Uh, so I apologize for that, but it's quite frankly nice to have a panel that, that was talking back to me, uh, unlike, <laughs> unlike because they're in person and not on a camera. Um, first off, a, a big thank to our expert panel here. They carried a whole lot of weight for us on this substantive issue because it is so broad. Uh, let's give them a brief round of applause. Um, and then, by way of run of show, we'll be breaking uh, for lunch now. That's being served out in the, uh, the main lobby area. We will reconvene here at 1.30 sharp for our next round of fireside chats with uh, Julia Piper and David Livingston, senior advisor to uh, the special envoy for climate change, John Kerry. So with that, I'll leave you be. Thank you. <laughs>